Welcome to the Renovating Riches Podcast. Entrepreneurs from Houston teaching you everything they know about entrepreneurship and real estate with the best guests in the real estate industry. Subscribe today on all major platforms and gear up for another episode of Renovating Riches. Welcome to the Renovating Riches Radio Podcast. Today with Mr. Ethan Gao. Thank you for coming, Ethan. Hey, thanks for having Appreciate me, Ricardo. You. Uh, so, full disclosure, Ethan drove all the way out here to Chinatown to pick up a check. And I said, man, how about we do a podcast? Yep. So, uh, Ethan is a real estate attorney in the Houston area and uh, he's, a, he's also an investor. And he's got a vast knowledge on many different things, on what to do, what not to do, paperwork-wise. Uh, he's also associated with a title company, so we might ask some questions about you know, title and whatnot. As long as he can disclose uh, the information, uh, we'll go from there. But um, let's get started, man. What, uh, who is Ethan? Where, where do you come from? Sure. So I um, went to elementary school in Waco, Texas, and I went to junior high in high school in Toledo, Ohio. I then went to Cornell University. I got a bachelor's degree in economics, and then I went directly to Columbia Law School, and I got a law degree. I started my career um, as a corporate lawyer on Wall Street doing large M&A type of transactions. Um, along the way, I met my wife first day of college, and uh, she d did an investment banking program out of college, and then she ended up going to Harvard Business School, and we moved to Boston for two years. And then we moved back to New York once she graduated. And then at that point, we were kind of a few years into our career. And then I made a big career change and moved to Hong Kong for two years. Oh, wow. Where I was uh, in house counsel for a mutual fund and then a hedge fund. And at that point, we had a kid. And then, you know, we didn't really like living in Hong Kong or Boston or New York, just too expensive kind of culture. It was very work uh, oriented and a lot of insane hours and insane people. So we moved to Houston. I worked at a big firm downtown doing large uh, M&A deals for uh, capital markets deals for uh, oil and gas companies. And I got into real estate about four years ago, kind of backwards. Uh, I started as a rental guy and then- uh, So you started as an investor? I started as a pure play. I actually really started as a pure play lender. Okay. So I started kind of, sometimes, you know, a lot of people say they want to end up a lender. I kind of started as one. Okay. Yeah. And, and you were lending for private funds or Correct. To, a, to a friend that was in the business or? Nope, it was, uh, I started lending online. So this was actually when crowdfunding came okay. up, which you're very familiar with, Raising Your Fund. Right. Jobs Act, I think 2012, I wanna say, just opened up all kinds of crowdfunding projects. So I would sit at my desk at my job and I would just invest 5K, 10K at a time into a bunch of different projects. Right. And then at a certain point, I just decided, well, I should go to some local networking events and meet people. At that point, I, you know, read so many articles, you know, listened to so many podcasts, Bigger Pockets, et cetera, and I, I ended up meeting my first borrower who was leaving the corporate world and he was going to be a fix and flipper, and I lent him money and I basically probably did all of his deals for the next two years and added a few other borrowers along the way. Good deal, man. So that's a that's a very interesting tra uh, trajectory that you have because. Usually when you get sucked in into that corporate world uh, where you end up, especially in your case, being a legal counsel or, or whatever your position was in all these different firms, uh, you're making a pretty good chunk of change and you have a pretty good lifestyle. You know, I'm, I'm assuming that in Hong Kong, even though you probably didn't want to raise kids over there, uh, you, it, it's okay to, you know, it's, it's a very fast moving uh, yeah. environment. Yeah. Um, so uh, to to come to what you're doing today as an investor is, is completely different. Uh, it is, and it's, a, <laughs> and it's amazing. I wish I discovered this world earlier. So right. coming from a Wall Street super academic background, you're essentially taught that the market is efficient. Right. And if somebody has a great idea or there's an the investment thesis, it's basically gone. By the time you get to it, it's gone. Right. And then if it's not gone, everybody's gonna copy it the next day and then it will be gone. Right. So the story I tell is when I was in Hong Kong, I was actually uh, in-house counsel for the Asian offices of a hedge fund, which was like either number two or number three performer 
uh, for for one year. Okay. Um, they they basically front run the Fed. That they were they were more of a fixed income fund, and they made like a 70, 80 percent return, which is insane. Right. For a fixed income fund. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, like with all things, that's when they expanded. They hired me, they paid me a nice salary and bonus, paid all these guys. Um, you know, and then the next year they got a lot more money, and uh, everybody already knew their strategy, and then they regressed immediately to the mean. Right. Wow. So it's super hard to actually uh, invest money in a, you know, good way. Essentially, that's kind of what we're taught. But you know, in real estate, as you see, there's all kinds of distress opportunities, all oh, yeah. kinds of market dislocations, special situations. There, there's there's a lot of good, safe, uh, risk adjusted ways of making money in a local real estate market. Yeah, and if you take the house back or the property back or whatever the case might be, you turn around, sell it, you get your money back, and you go then move some. on to the next one. Right? Precisely. Right. There's all kinds of ways of of hedging risk. Right. Okay, so how was that first transaction as a lender? Like, what, what did it look like? It was fantastic. So it was a guy I met off of Pick Bigger Pockets. He's an active real estate investor now. We're still friends. Um, you know, it was basically, he, he, this was... He had already done a couple of deals while he was working corporate, and then he wanted to move into this full time. So he really just had a, it was almost the perfect deal. I was pretty fortunate to have met him as my first borrower and to have that, this deal come up. He essentially was a failed wholesale, okay. which I mean, he bought the property and he already had a buyer, but he couldn't actually get him to close at the same time. Oh, wow. There was a two week period of time that he actually needed to buy it. Okay. So that's where I came in. Uh, I essentially lent him probably close to 100% of the funds. He got a pretty good deal. Right. So if I had to take it back or if he had to flip it, it would have been fine. And within two weeks, he paid me back. So if that's your first deal and you make a bunch of points, and fees on the front end for doing relatively little work. That's not a bad way to decide to continue doing it. Yeah, I just met a guy actually um, a few days ago, and and um, he's an investor. Uh, he's in Texas. Uh, I think he's out of Austin. I can't remember exactly what city, but he was introduced to me because he wants to be on the transactional funding side. Okay. So all he wants to do is transactional funding. Oh, I would love to do that. Can I also do that? Please? Absolutely. So <laughs> you and I have talk, talked about this before, right? So, so I said, I said, okay. So you just want to make a bunch of points, yes. over and over and over again. No risk. No risk. You Same know. thing. Just, just go to the like, yeah. every day for wires. And he's like, yeah, I got a couple of million dollars. I can deploy right now. I was like, well, you're gonna have a couple of million dollars in your bank account for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. Because it's most tough. most of the tough. wholesalers are gonna go. They're not gonna try to transactional fund this thing. Correct. It's too expensive. Too expensive. Uh, we're only going to do it when, like, for instance, we have a property that has got a bunch of heirs and I need to get them out of the way. Yep. And then we already have a buyer, but I don't want these guys to see what I'm making. Exactly. I don't want this guy to see what I'm making. I need to transact this thing. Exactly. That's what I would do it. But on smaller deals, it wouldn't make sense because the size of the loan will eat up a large portion of the profit for the transactional fund. Absolutely. And I don't think he understood that before he talked to me. Okay. And then I said, look, man, you're probably going to be better off being a lender going six months, 12 months. And now you have a, you know, steady cash flow. If you, even if you're doing 10%, 12%, whatever, however many points, but well, your money is going to be working all the time and you're going to be getting, you know, the returns more steady. I supposed to do one transaction of funding today, nothing in three weeks, maybe another one in four weeks. Yeah, you're gonna make points. Your rate of return is a little higher, but you're. I don't think you're gonna be able to deploy all the money right away on on on. on I deals. think it's. I don't think it's an actual business. I think it's unsustainable. It and is. I think one of the things we should talk about too is on the title side. I mean, there's a lot of title companies that that don't do a double close pass through, <laughs> but there's title companies that will do it. So it makes transactional funding essentially not required. It, it is not required. So it's not required. So if that's the case in this market and you're trying to you're trying to sell a product that's not even required half the time, I mean unless the market just continues to be super inefficient, you're not going to deploy that money. And, and I actually mentioned to him, so full disclosure, Ethan works with Fidelity title and they, they do um, double closings and, and, and all sorts we of do all kinds of investors. All kinds of investment uh, transactions. And I did tell this guy, I said like, look man, um, there's actually title companies out there that are double closing and they they don't I don't have to go borrow money to Correct. to close on it. He didn't know that either. Right. So yeah. like I said, it's not Wall Street market's not that efficient. Well, now that you all your viewers know, maybe it's going to get slightly more efficient. 
Well, this is what this podcast is all about, right? So it's about education. So, um, so that was your first deal. Yep. Then, how was your progress after that? Like, sure. So on the lender side, I mean, so um, I kind of learned how hard money lenders do it. At a certain point, I was large enough, and a couple, you know, a couple of my borrowers were doing a lot of repeat business, where I ran out of money. So when you start running out of money, you start looking at, well, you know, I've got my IRA over here. My dad's gonna put up a hundred k, or you know, I, I love life insurance, so I had a bunch of money in my life insurance policy, so I followed against that. And then once you've done that, and you're still out of money, and you got a lot of good deals, and you don't want to lose your borrowers, right? You, you kind of yeah, at that point, they, they might fall in love with another lender that has more money. Unfortunately, and they're gone. Unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I love all my borrowers, but unfortunately, um, they, they lending is in some ways right similar to title. It's a commodity product that you compete primarily on price and then service and relationship. Right? You know, yes, but I do have lenders that I work with um, that we up till today we still got the same agreement. Wow, the, the, even though as your experience and your credit yeah. and your credit worth yeah. has have increased. Yeah, because they, you know, on my case, they helped me a lot get, get to where at some point we were. And even though we're not borrowing anymore to flip or anything like that, um, they, they were the ones that helped us get to a certain point. And then we <laughs> recognized that. And we said, you know what, this person who's actually loaning out of their retirement accounts or whatever, they went through the through through the good times. They also helped us through the bad times. And why am I going to change him just based on a couple of extra points less, or or points or whatever interest rate or whatnot? I want to continue to be loyal to this person because they. So I really believe, and Dennis both uh, and I believed in working with the same people. Yeah, we might go there and say, man, you know, you're doing X amount of percent. Can you come down a little bit? You know. Easier for us now. We got more experience. We can do this better. For the most part, they're like, "Yeah, sure, no problems." Um, so even though we were being offered money at a lower rate, what we did is we took that money, but for some other projects. Right. And so we you're still able to. Deploy. So we were still able to get that, but I wasn't going to turn my back on the people that helped us, you know, at the beginning. So uh, we were very loyal to them, and we still work with some of them. Right. Uh, even though we're not borrowing anymore like we used to. Yeah. Um, you know, because we're moving in a different direction. Um, we were just talking about that offline on syndications. Yeah, yeah. And those guys don't care for that because they, um, people that want to become part of a syndication, uh, that's more passive, it's more long term. Yep. Um, it's not as active. No. Uh, and these guys, they really want to see a couple of points every now and then. They want to yeah. They want to have a steady. Yeah, different income. mindset, different use. Completely different, different animal. Yeah. So for somebody to just go based on, on, on money, it's kind of like, I don't know. It, it, it yeah, I, I can see the point on them saving money on points and interest, but at the same time, you uh, you know, if somebody helps you get to a, to a certain level, there's some loyalty built in there. You know, at least on our case, that that was our case. Uh, that that makes you guys a really good borrower. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, good borrowers can also take a different attitude, which is fine. I mean, everybody, you know, people kind of end up in different spots over time, so you can't really expect to do the same thing with somebody all the time. Well, but you've done flips too, right? And, I have. And, and so, rentals. So how, yeah. how was that your, your landlord experience? like? Sure, so that's how I got into real estate. I bought a rental property, kind of ass backwards, bought it full retail, tenants, toilets, termites, whatever the other T's are. It's just <laughs> annoying. You know, I basically yeah. have a 4%, 5% annuity. Right. So after I did that for about a year, I even had property management, that terrible, you know, uh, I, did, yeah. I was going to bet that I, I don't think you watch this podcast. Yeah. But yeah, property, property managers are like life insurance agents and like escrow officers, you know, yeah. 80% over garbage, you know, only 20% over any good. Yeah. Um, so that's when I decided to do all that research on real estate investments. You know, I had this rental, it was annoying me, I was barely making any money. And so I would watch YouTube videos or read articles or watch people on TV say, I barely graduated from high school, I didn't have any money, I made all this money in real estate. And I'm like, well, I went to these fancy schools. I have a ton of money. How the hell am I not making money in real estate? Right. I'm doing something wrong. Yes. So then I started researching it and then started meeting people locally and really figuring out, yeah, there is a there is a local market that is not hyper efficient where there's things that people can do to make money. Right. Obviously, one way is to buy something very, very cheaply. 
The other thing to do is to operate the property and rehab it very well. I mean, those mm -hmm. are the two, two largest components of, of making money right there, right? So it all made sense. So that's how I transitioned to being a lender. And then I met another lawyer through one of my friends that I've been doing some stuff in real estate. And he was a lawyer that wanted to flip properties and flip a lot more. So he and I have flipped over 100 properties in the past three years. And we're continuing to do that. And actually, that's one of the reasons I lend less because I see more opportunity either flipping. You, you can take them down yourself. Yeah, exactly. No. Right. I mean, one good flip is equivalent to making four loans, three yeah. loans, right? Yeah. So it, it sometimes it just makes more sense. But with my repeat borrowers and other really you know high quality borrowers, I, mean, I, I still look at deals you know all day long. It's it's where you know with the rates and the points are too low. Like I was telling you before. I make a certain risk-free rate of return in my life insurance policy, mm -hmm. right? Well, I, I just sleep at night, I don't have to worry about it, I don't have to do anything. Right. Stock, stock market can be up, stock market can be down, real estate can be up, real estate can be up, doesn't matter. I'm gonna make this safe rate of return. Um, and then a flip, there's potentially a lot of opportunity to make a really good return. So lending is somewhere in between. So if someone wants to borrow from me too cheaply, it just doesn't make sense to do. Yeah, yeah, the, there's, no, there's no incentive for you to do Correct. that. Correct. So, so, okay, you went lending, then you went to uh, flipping, uh, flipping, and, and being a landlord. Uh, do, are you still a landlord, or I still own that? I'm gonna own that rental property probably forever. It's okay. in Cinco Ranch, it's the fire hood. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see how people make money in those areas. They don't. They buy it all cash, and they're happy with the four percent annuity. Yeah, and it, it's, it's more. It's more of an appreciation. Uh, you know, hope for twenty year appreciation. I don't think my mind is even appreciated in the past six years. Yeah, it, what kind of price range is, is that it's property? It's in the low 200s. Okay. Yeah, but that property will always be rented. I mean... Yeah, it's it's hard to even get the 1% rule right. over there. Like, you know, you're looking at like 0. 0.8, 0. Yeah. 0.7. And then if you have a good... Well, I've, I've been fortunate. I've always had good tenants. I've never had light, late payments, and they've always treated the property decently. Right. Um, but if, yeah, um, if there was a rough tenant in there, then I probably would have already sold it. Okay, and how do you get into the whole title company thing? So that was kind of another back end way of getting into it. So just, I made over 120 loans over the past four years and we flipped over 100 houses in the past three right. years. So in those transactions, we probably closed at 50 to 80 different, I can't even count. Title companies. Title companies and fee attorney offices. You know, some were good, some were bad. I would say 50% of them were bad customer service. Mm -hmm. Out of the 50% that was decent, you know, half wasn't ideal. Right. So then I would notice on their footers, and some of these were in Dallas, um, other, yeah. UK, Austin, I don't even know how the hell title got open there. Um, but I would notice on the signature line of some of these guys, it would say, you know, blah, 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 JD, fee attorney for blah, 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 title company. Right. And at some point I just said, look, I'm an attorney. I went to Columbia Law School. Why can't I be a fee attorney? So then I did research and, you know, by virtue of being an attorney, it's much easier to set up a relationship with a title company or open a fee attorney office. Right. Where in in some ways you're almost like a franchise of a title agency or a title company. That's why I thought you owned the title company. I said, oh, that's Ethan's title uh, company. You know, I don't I don't have fifty billion dollars. Yeah. It's a publicly traded. Uh, well, I don't know if the market cap's that high, but it's a publicly traded uh, title company. Uh, yeah, I never knew what the that model for that particular title company was. So I each, didn't know if, if they sold franchises is, or whatnot. You know, I have Each no state idea. is different. So in Texas, uh, basically attorneys can get, I mean, it's not quite a franchise, but it's somewhat like a franchise of a, of a title company. Um, other states, it's different. Other states, there's no title insurance agencies. It's actually closed by attorneys and yeah. attorneys issue it, I guess, based primarily on their malpractice policies or something like that. So I got, I, that's how I got into title. I went around, met with a bunch of different title companies. I said, look, I control this much business myself on my flips and then you know I influence these other guys when I lend them money I mean right we've experienced a lot of bad customer service title companies you know some I just said you know don't don't even bother trying to borrow money from me if you're going there because the customer yeah. service is so bad or you know the quality of the tech even even scarier some of the technical stuff is messed up like legal descriptions could be wrong or actual title issues could arise or they flat out don't pay title claims or you know a variety of different things could happen um, and then I met up with a few title companies, and just and then worked something really worked out something well with Fidelity. They're very investor focused and uh, really good at good at what they do. Good deal. And and um, so what exactly do you do at, uh, for the title company? Uh, sure. So essentially, um, I more or less just tell people I know in real estate about the benefits of closing with us and the specific escrow teams that I use there. 
Um, like I said, super investor friendly, deal with wholesalers, uh, distressed sellers all the time. So know what we're doing. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of investor friendly. Right, transactions. Of, pop, pop, yeah, transactions. Most of my clients are actually wholesalers because wholesalers are the ones that get to control title right. in most situations where they open title. Um, and then if there's legal work on it, I'll usually do the legal work or uh, partner with another lawyer to do some of the more complicated legal work that happens on some of these files. Gotcha. All right. And um, so where do you go forward from here now? Like, I like everything I'm doing. I mean, it's, um, you know, I like looking at real estate deals, whether flipping them or uh, lending on them and meeting people that could either use me for legal services or use the like title we do. company. So yeah, we've like used it for both things. Yeah, we've used it for title exactly. and for uh, legal work. Yep. That was, um, that was what my check was supposed to be. For. Yeah, exactly. So he's been chasing that one for a while, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> but uh, It's okay. Ricardo's a good client. I don't, I don't usually uh, wait this long to collect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we, um, we basically, uh, actually on that particular property, yeah. we didn't know what the spread was going to be. So Yeah, we, you had no idea back then. I had no idea. So yep. I opened title with my other attorneys. And then when all these things started coming up, they said they told me it's like you gotta go find another attorney. And you yep. came right to my conflict of interest right away. Yep. It's a conflict of interest for us. We can't do this paperwork. And I was okay, I'm gonna call Ethan now. And uh, that's how you got involved. Uh, but we've also sent files to you. Uh, we yep. actually sent sent you one that couldn't close not long ago. Yep. Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, how do people get in contact with you? Uh, my email is Ethan Gao, just my name, E T H A N G A O at gmail.com. I'm super responsive. A lot of people complain about their attorneys, you know, not responding back. I basically respond back all the time. My joke is, if you haven't heard from me in 24 hours, I'm probably dead or yeah, got kidnapped or something. Yeah. Um, so he's also doing. Uh, so he does title work. If you need title work around the Houston area, reach out to him. Uh, he'll and also surrounding counties too. Right. We can even do the metros in San Antonio, and okay. Austin, and Dallas as well. So it's all Texas, or there's uh, almost every county. It, uh, the, you know, some of the smaller counties, we you don't have, have to have, work with the local. You have to work with the local one. You do a split, and you might not have that much control, so it's not quite the same. Right. Um, also, for any real estate um, related transactions, yeah, feel then, free to give me a call. Then he can help you out with uh, drafting paperwork. Um, I don't know, operating agreements and those kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I. I f uh, the most common legal work I do is forming people's LLCs, doing operating agreements, partnership agreements. Uh, real estate related documents, joint ventures, and uh, investment type of uh, agreements. Um. Good deal. Um, so, guys, if you are if you're looking, uh, and I see on the forums all the time. Does anybody know a um, attorney that's real estate? Friendly, right. yeah. you know, investor friendly. Well, understands investors. Right. Well, you're looking at one right now. He just gave up uh, his Gmail uh, email address, so feel free to contact him. You also do loans. Now, when you if yep. you send a deal for him to fund, make sure you do a lot of up due diligence <laughs> up front and, and that you submit whatever he's going to ask for as far as, you know, deal related or personal related or whatnot. Um, that way he's, cause he's probably looking at, I don't know how many deals on a, on a, on ah, a consistent it's not, basis. It's, 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 it's easy to manage. Um, yeah. Cause your business is very personal. So yeah, um, it's not hard to manage. You so know, even when I had a lot of loans outstanding and everything, I mean, it was really just six or seven heavy repeat guys. And then, a, you know, a few kind of onesies and twosies. Right. You know, I'm not, you know, as big as some of those big, uh, hard money lending companies. How many like properties that. have you had to take back? Zero. That's good. Out of 120 loans, I've lost money on none of them. Uh, there's only one property. I didn't really technically take it back, but I did it more as a joint venture when it wasn't succeeding. And that was early in my career and shouldn't have done that. But the borrowers, you know, he's somebody I still keep in touch with now. And he hires me, Yeah, I guess, he, yeah, he hires me to do legal work, including uh, he started making loans himself and then he had to take some stuff back. So I had to send out foreclosure notices on his behalf. Uh, so it's kind of like the, the circle of life. Um, but you know what? The way you just mentioned is pretty good because you you were able to work with a borrower. Yeah. Uh, that way, you know, nobody was in a bind. No. Um, and and you were able to pull it through. So, which a lot of the lenders they don't they don't do that. Well, they just foreclose immediately. And they foreclose on it and then they <laughs> say, "I hate you," you know, oh, really? and that that kind of deal. And I, I've been I've been very fortunate. My borrowers have all been good. Um, that one deal, the borrower was good. The deal wasn't as good. 
And I mean, we worked through it. It wasn't ideal for either party, but like we're still, like I said, we're still friendly to this day. And he, you know, tries to refer me stuff, and he's used me for for stuff too. You know, there's no reason to burn relationships unless you know somebody no, no, really no. does something you know bad or maliciously. You know. Yeah, and there's there is some lenders in this business that really private lenders that have no business of being lenders. You yes. know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, they should just work, go work with a Harmon lender, put their money to work over there. Yeah, and guys. that's with somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. There's that's that's how I mean. You know, we talk about movies that we've seen, right? If if, if somebody comes to you very enthusiastically about, I'm gonna do this great deal with this blow, you know, you can almost just see the ending where they're gonna be in tears and money has been lost. Yeah. Right. You can almost spot that with a certain archetype of people. Yeah. So, anyways, guys, uh, reach out to Ethan. He's uh, he's a very good attorney. I refer him every time, uh, every chance I get a time, I get a chance uh, to do so. He's working with us. He's also uh, working with many other people here in the Houston area, um, other investors, wholesalers, and 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 people that need uh, legal services. Everybody needs an attorney. Um, there is people out there that I've seen sometimes trying to go draft their own documents for closings and trusts and things that I was like, oh my God, why is this person taking such a risk? Oh yeah, actually, yeah. One of the more, more common documents I do is, is loan documents for other private lenders. I just use the form that I've improved over a number of years on my own deals and I use that for my clients. Um, I guess the only the other thing I should say is, yeah, I see quite a lot of uh, pretty close to un unauthorized practice of law um, with some real estate investors trying to save money, which, which I get, but. Yeah, but like, there is a guy that I know that he closes everything himself. Sometimes the 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 uh, the, the notary that's doing the transaction it, it doesn't know what the hell they're looking at. I mean, it just smells wrong, you know. I, I, I'm I'm like just use an attorney, pay the fee. There's some pretty poor, um, yeah. There's some pretty bad quality forms for legal uh, loan documents that I've seen that too short, don't cover enough, or too long and not relevant. So you can kind of go both ways. You know, you, something could be really short and not cover anything, and something could be super long and then not even cover the important stuff either. So right. some of that's just legacy, or somebody downloaded it from somewhere or got it from some other attorney for a while back. So, if, you know, if you're doing that, I would just suggest at least, you know, I'm not saying pay a lawyer every time, but at least get your forms reviewed to make sure that they're at least up to date and good enough. And then if you want to go play lawyer yourself and, you know, quasi unauthorized practice of law, you know, go ahead. Yeah, I don't highly recommend that. Um, I highly recommend you guys find an attorney. If you're in the Houston area and you're in need of a tr an attorney, Ethan is uh, at your service. If you got any questions, holler at him. He's got his Gmail address out there already. Uh, don't forget to hit share, like, and subscribe. Share this with everybody that you know that is interested in uh, real estate or entrepreneurship, so, because this, we cover all kinds of stuff here, not just real estate. Um, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you. Yep.